and invite you to open a Bible to John chapter 10. As we continue our sermon series, as we begin the new year, we are looking at the I am statements found in the gospel of John that Jesus makes to reveal to you and to me and to the whole world who he is, who he is as our God. And the reason Jesus does this is because back in the story of Exodus, God appears to Moses, makes all these wonderful promises where he tells Moses, I've heard the cries and the pleas and the prayers of my people. I've come down to be with you, and I have also come to answer your prayers and to deliver you. And these are wonderful promises that God makes to his people throughout generation to generation, all the way to you and me. And when Moses asks him, well, what's your name? Who do I tell people who my God is? And God answers with this statement. He says, I am who I am. And it's a way of saying, I am the God who exists. I will always be, I will always be the one giving life and existence to all things. And so when Jesus comes to begin his earthly ministry, to ultimately fulfill those promises of God in Exodus in a much greater way, to hear the prayers of his people that we need grace and forgiveness and salvation, to be the God, Emmanuel, who is with us in our struggles and our sufferings and our sins, and then to ultimately deliver us through the cross and his resurrection. He makes these statements, seven of them, where he says, I am, and then he explains who he is. And it's a way of him revealing to you and to me that he is not just a nice teacher, he's not just a miracle worker or a prophet, he is the God who hears your prayers, the God who is with you, and the God who rescues and redeems you. And today, as we get to know Jesus better, the I am statement is one that you're probably already familiar with. And if I had asked you what the seven were, this probably would have made your guessing list, which is, I am the good shepherd. And last week, he talked about how he was the door or the gate to the sheep pen. And so this is all like the very next verse, okay? So if you've been following along and paying attention to the sermons, you'll know we're just going to the next couple verses here in John. And one of the things that comes along with Jesus being the gate to the pasture or the sheep pen, comes along with Jesus being the shepherd, is that you and I are his sheep. Now, when I was growing up, my church made the radical decision to sell its original property and move to a different location in the city. When I say radical, because we had to have voters meetings about that. And everybody was just like, this is the best idea ever. We're not going to argue about it at all. <laughs> sure. yeah. There was emotions involved for certain. Now, I was a little kid. I was like, all I asked my mom was, is the playground going with us? That was all I cared about at the voters meeting. Okay. And it did. I was so happy. All right. <laughs> but one of the things I remember that my church made in this decision is they took certain parts of the old building and property that were very precious to people, and they reused them on the new campus. And one of the things that everybody loved, because it was in a very common walking area, was a statue of Jesus. And it was a statue of Jesus with a sheep or a lamb over his shoulders, and he's carrying this wounded sheep, and it's this image that this is who our Jesus is. He's the shepherd who cares for us and loves us and redeems us, and we're his sheep. And it's a beautiful picture. I love that statue. It's still at my home church, and I walk by it every time I'm home, and it just brings up all these wonderful images of who Jesus is. But the flip side of Jesus being the shepherd and us being the sheep is a couple of things that you and I don't actually like. One is, he's the shepherd. And we're the sheep. And what I mean by that is, who tells who where to go? Anybody done the math on that? If he's the shepherd and we're the sheep, guess who leads the sheep? Who's in charge of the direction of the sheep and the flock? Jesus. Which means you and I as sheep are not what? In charge. And if you don't like, oh, I don't struggle with being in charge, Jesus is in charge. Okay, here's another word. In control. Now everybody's freaking out. Like, oh, no. Because right? one of the things we will do as human beings is, especially when we're in church, we know the right Bible answer is, of course, Jesus is the what? The shepherd 
and we're the sheep. Of course he's in charge. Of course he's in control. And when we're in church, we go, what? That is so great and wonderful and awesome. Because why? You're in church and it's the right thing to say, right? (laughs) But in the reality of life, guess what you and I struggle with? Jesus being the shepherd, right? Like, we we know it in our faith, and and we know it in our minds, but a lot of times, as human beings, we will struggle with releasing control and saying, you're the shepherd, you get to be the one that guides me and leads me wherever you as the shepherd desire. That's hard sometimes. Because you might be okay with Jesus being the shepherd, as long as you get to voice your sheep opinion, right, and say, I would like to go this way. Let's, let's turn left here, let's go. Right, when Jesus is the shepherd and he's the one in charge and he's the one in control and he's the one leading us, it also means he's the one deciding where we go. And that can be a difficult reality for us as human beings. Now, the other flip side of us being sheep and Jesus being the shepherd, as precious as it is, and we're going to talk today about why it's a precious image, is that, like I said last week, sheep are dumb. So even though we know Jesus saying, he's the good shepherd, right? You probably already knew that and knew that Bible verse before you came here this morning, that Jesus is the good shepherd, and okay, he's God, and he's in control, and he's in charge, and all these things are wonderful, And then we go, I think I know better. I have a better plan. I have a better direction. I have a better route to take on this journey called life. And so I'm going to take it. And I'm going to tell Jesus that, you know, we're going to go my way. Right? So here's as a pastor, I, I listen to you. I listen to people as I pastor them throughout my ministry. And one of the ways that we subtly... Um, wrestle with and struggle against Jesus being in charge is instead of him being the leader, telling the flock, telling the sheep, you and me, where to go in our lives, we we don't want to be arrogant about it, right? Because you're all very good, humble Christians, right? So we don't want to be arrogant towards God. So what we do is we try to disguise it with this fake humility where it's, I'm just going to, we're walking side by side, Right? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, no, like Jesus, yeah, he's still trying. But like, we're, we're partners in life together. He's holding my hand. We're, we're walking together. And anybody ever walked with somebody and they didn't tell you that they wanted to dart off to look at something and you're holding a hand and they yank you and you're like, where are we going? Right? Or if you've walked a dog and you've been trying to train a dog where to walk and they're like, let's go here, let's go here. And you're like, well, we're on a leash, we're together, right? Please tell me you know what I'm talking about, right? We do this with Jesus. We're like, oh, no, he's in charge. But he's not, like, fully in charge. We're we're more like buddies. And so we're going to walk hand in hand. And every once in a while, I'm going to yank him this way just to let him know. We should be, let's go check this out over here. Let's go do this thing over here. You know why? Because we're dumb sheep. And we think we know better. We think we're wiser. We go, oh, yeah, that's neat. You're the shepherd and I'm the sheep and you love me. This is wonderful. And oh, yeah, you're in charge, but not really. So we struggle with this. It's a wonderful statement. And I I am making the assumption that most of you would believe this statement. Yes, Jesus is the good shepherd. Yes, he is my shepherd. we, We believe it and we know it. Now, here's the struggle. We don't always trust it. Right, the, the Greek word for faith, that's often translated faith, and that's what Jesus is talking about here, my sheep know me, they, they believe in me, is the word pistos, and it also means to trust. And so faith requires this act of trust, that Jesus is the good shepherd. I can believe it, I can say the words, right? He is the good shepherd. He loves the sheep. He loves me. We can believe all those things. But one of the things that Jesus is calling us to do in this text is to also trust it in our daily lives. For me, anyway, that can be really hard. Because 
I want to be in control, right? And we always have the phrase, if you want something done right, do it yourself, right? Which means I don't trust any other human beings. <laughs> That's what you're saying when you say that, when I say that, right? We, we struggle with this aspect of pistos, of not just faith, but I'm trusting that as he leads me as the good shepherd, he's going to lead me to good things and to the right things for my life. I don't know about you, I would love to say, I trust Jesus the good shepherd all the time, but I simply don't. There are so many times in my life where I wanna walk beside him and, and yank him to certain directions that I wanna go, or in fact, there are often times where I just wanna walk in front of him and be like, yeah, it's good. You go wherever you want, Jesus. I'm going this way. And so what Jesus is doing when he says he's the good shepherd, he's inviting you and I to a level of trust, not just for, this is what I believe on Sunday mornings. This is not just what I believe when someone asks me, like, what do you think about Jesus? But that in the practicality of my daily life, with my relationships, with my family, with work, the next steps in my life, that I would say, I want Jesus to be the one leading me and guiding me. I don't want to be the one trying to lead and guide Jesus. So why should we trust him? Well, the first thing that he says is that he is the good shepherd. Not just a shepherd, not just someone with some good advice or wise thoughts or, you know, hey, these might not be such bad ideas. He's saying he is the good shepherd. Now, here's why that matters. Throughout the Bible, the word good means perfection, and in fact, at one point in the Gospels, there's a young man who comes up to Jesus, wants to follow him and tell him, you be my shepherd and lead me wherever you want. And he calls him good teacher. And Jesus responds with, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God alone. So good in the Old and the New Testament means perfection. It means he's God. So he's saying, I'm not just like another shepherd. All right, I, as a pastor, that's the word pastor means shepherd, I'm just another shepherd, all right? <laughs> like, there's others out there like me. Unfortunately for you, there's others out there like me, right? And we have this idea of, oh, okay, shepherds. What Jesus is saying is, I'm not like all the other shepherds. I'm not like all the other teachers or the wise people in the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the perfect one. I am the holy one. He is God as our shepherd. So the first reason Jesus is giving to you and me of why should I trust him as the shepherd over my whole life is he's saying, because he is good. He is perfect. He is holy. He is God. We go, oh, okay, so he knows things that I don't know. How many of you don't know everything yet? You're working on it, right? Yeah, in some ways that can be really frustrating. Other times, though, when you come to that humble realization, it actually sets you free to realize, okay, I don't, I don't know everything. I don't have to be in control of everything. I don't have to be in charge of everything. And Jesus is saying, exactly. I'm the God shepherd for your life. I am the good shepherd for your life. The other reason is verse 11. He says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And he's saying, here's why you can trust me. Here's why he is the good shepherd we're following. He says, because I'm laying my life down for the sheep, for you and me, Right? The dumb, stubborn, prideful sheep that want to be in control, that want to be in charge, that don't want to listen to him, that veer off in her own direction, says, I'm giving my life for you. And so he's saying, here is why you should trust me, because I love you. The love of Jesus is what's changing and transforms our hearts and brings us to a point where we actually trust in him as our shepherd to guide us. Because the evidence of, well, how do I know that Jesus actually wants good for my life? How do I know he's not going to let me down? 
How do I know he's going to lead me to life and fullness and abundance, all the things that he promises in John chapter 10? And the answer is, he's the one who gives his life for you. So if you're a traditional Lutheran, the answer is the cross. That becomes the evidence of how do I know that this is a good shepherd who loves me and wants good for me and is worth trusting. And the answer becomes, he gives his life for you on the cross. Even while you and I are stubborn, sinful, wandering sheep. And then he gives another answer. In verse 12, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. So the third reason Jesus is giving to you and me of why we should be able to trust him as the good shepherd, he says, I know my own. I know my sheep. In the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus is teaching about prayer, he makes this promise that says, God knows what you need before you even ask for it. That's a statement revealing the goodness of your Father. And Jesus is saying, I'm the shepherd that leads you to the Heavenly Father. So one of the reasons we trust in him and say, yes, he is a good shepherd worth giving my life to and following him in his direction in every aspect of my life, not just in church things, but in my whole life, is because he's the good shepherd who knows me. So when I cry out to him, like Moses and the people of Israel did, he's the God who hears my prayers. When I am pleading with him and longing for things in life that only he can give to me, he says, I know you. I know what your heart and your soul needs. I know what you need in your life before you even ask it. And so one of the reasons you and I can trust him and he is worth trusting is simply this. He knows us. Because he knows us, he cares for us. And he provides for us. This is what Psalm 23 says, right? He leads me to green pastures and lays me down beside still waters. Those are the things that a sheep needs to live. So he's saying, I know what you as my people need. And I'm the good shepherd that will lead you to it and give it to you. And I love this imagery that he talks about the hired hand and who abandons people. And then earlier he was talking about how the thief comes. And so throughout this chapter of us being the sheep and Jesus being our shepherd, he is putting himself up against the thieves and the hired hands. The people and the ideas, and ultimately he's talking about Satan who deceive us because they look like shepherds, but they're not the good shepherd. They sound smart and wise, but they don't actually give us the things that lead to life like Jesus does. And every once in a while, we're all guilty of this as silly sheep. We listen to those voices rather than the voice of Jesus. And Jesus is making the point like, but they don't know you. I mean, because they don't know you and they don't care about you, they don't stay with you through all things. And Jesus is saying, look, that the thief comes to destroy the hired hand when things get tough, when the wolf shows up. <laughs> By the way, that's a bad day for sheep, right? If a wolf shows up, and it's like, oh, the hired hand just leaves. What was Jesus revealed, right? This is the fourth reason you and I have to trust him as our good shepherd. He doesn't leave. In verse 12, he says, he was a hired hand and not a shepherd, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. But that's not who Jesus is. Again, it's going back all the way to the promises that God made to Moses, that I've come to be with my people in their suffering and their struggles. We have a phrase in our culture, fair weather friend, right? The idea that like someone is your friend when things are going great, but then when you're in need or you're hurting or suffering, guess what happens in real life? Not everybody is there for you, right? 
Now, that can lead to some bitterness where you're like, well, I'm going to cut all these people out of my life, <laughs> right? But we might have all experienced this, right, where it's just like, oh, I was really hurting, I was really struggling, and these people stayed with me and supported me and loved me. That's what Jesus is describing himself as, as the good shepherd. He is a good friend who, when the wolf shows up, and there's danger, and there's struggles, and there's temptations, and there's the ups and downs of life. He's saying, everybody else will flee. The hired hand, the thief, they'll all run away. But the good shepherd stays with his sheep. Right? He is the God who is with us in our suffering. So why should I trust him? Well, because I can trust him in every circumstance and situation in life. Even when things are going great and we're in a nice green pasture and there's a nice, beautiful, flowing river of water and everything's awesome, or even when the wolf shows up and wants to destroy everything and it feels like chaos is what rules my life, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd who is with you in both. And so he is worth trusting with our lives. So again, in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now here's the really, really good news for you and me who are not here when Jesus originally said this. Verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this fold or flock. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. Um, he's talking about you and me and everybody else that wasn't standing there right at that moment going, I love Jesus. So what is Jesus saying? Here's how big my love is. Here's how amazing my love as the good shepherd for all people is that I have sheep scattered everywhere. You and I get lost. We wander off the path. We don't always listen to his voice. We don't always trust him as our good shepherd. He's saying, but I'm going to hunt you down. I'm going to pursue you and make you part of my flock, even if it's 2,000-something years later. So that's really good news for you and me and every sinner. As Jesus was talking to people, he says, but you know what? I've got other sheep in other places that I'm gonna bring into my fold, into my flock. I'm gonna bring them back home to the Heavenly Father. Now, here's what I love about what Jesus says. He calls us sheep before we already are sheep, right? Like, he's like, I got sheep that are wandering around. They're a little lost and confused, right? They're not sure where to go, right? They don't know about me yet. Here's why I bring this up, why I think it's so beautiful. There are still lost sheep in the world. And the way Jesus describes people here, and you and me, and every other sinner that's been redeemed by grace, he doesn't say, I've got a bunch of terrible, horrible, awful sinners out in the world that just don't do anything right in life and I gotta go find them, right? Not that you ever think that way about any other human being, because you're so full of grace and kindness and mercy, right? You would never judge another person. But that's not how Jesus describes it in verse 16, does he? Oh, I got this awful person over here. I got this person. You know, one of the things that fascinates me as a pastor over the years has been how people, meaning you, me and everybody else, whether they're a Christian or not, justifies their own sins because they're not as bad as somebody else's. Have you ever done that? You don't have to raise your hand. I know I usually ask you to raise your hand, but don't, don't on that one. It's okay. Lord loves you still. The first time this ever happened to me, I was on Vicarage, which is, if you're unfamiliar, a year-long internship for you get to pretend to be a pastor, but you're not really a pastor yet and you're serving at a church and under the supervision of another pastor, and it's a wonderful experience. And I remember one time, I had a gentleman come in and he wanted some pastoral counseling. It was the first time I ever had to do it. And I had taken zero classes on counseling at seminary because it doesn't happen to your fourth year. I don't know why, but it doesn't, okay? 
So I was fully prepared and knew exactly what to do and say in this moment. All right, and he sits down and begins talking. And we come to the realization that there's a sin that he's struggling with, which is usually, now that I have more experience, usually what's going on. And people kind of beat around the bush until eventually they get to the point where, okay, I'm brave enough to say it out loud. And I remember his sin and his details and everything that he had, was talking about. And before I could open my mouth to begin talking about the redeeming grace of Jesus, he looks at me and he goes, but you know, I don't really feel that bad about it because at least I'm not an alcoholic. And I sat there going, okay. I mean, that's good that you don't struggle with that addiction. But I thought we were talking about your sin, right? Like, your thing. Now, this was also the first time I'd ever pastorally counseled anybody, so it was a bit of a shock to me that someone would just so blatantly say it. But I think we often do it in many ways in our lives, in our hearts, our minds. Maybe you don't actually like, you know, hey, pastor, I want to sit down and tell you about my neighbor's sins and how bad they are. Please don't do that to me, all right? (laughs) But one of the things we do is we look down on other people, especially when their sins are not sins we struggle with. We do this as human beings. I am guilty of this, right? It's like, oh, that person's terrible. Why are they terrible? Well, they struggle with this. And we feel better about ourselves because I don't struggle about it. Now, here's what we, happens when we do this, is we stop viewing those people as lost sheep that are loved by Jesus. That's what Satan tricks us into. Oh, their sin is so bad. Right? Have any of you ever said, I can't believe they did that. I can't believe they said that. And sometimes we're just shocked, but other times we're looking down on them. Oh, I would never do something like that. And what we do when we have that attitude is we have the destructive mindset of Satan, which is, I don't view you as a lost sheep that Jesus loves and wants to redeem anymore. I just see you as this dirty sinner. What I love about verse 16 is when Jesus is speaking about you and me, poor, miserable sinners, however you want to grade yourself on that, when Jesus is thinking about the rest of the world and all the people that exist today that need his love and redemption and forgiveness, he doesn't look at them and go, oh, look at how bad and awful and terrible they are. What does he say about them in verse 16? I have other what? Sheep. What does that mean? Yeah, they're lost. They're wandering around in sin and stubbornness just like you and I do. What does it also mean, though? They are sheep that are what? They are loved by Jesus. They are people that Jesus loves and wants to bring home into his pasture. So this is the final reason. Why is Jesus the good shepherd? Why should I trust in him wherever he leads me? Because he's the shepherd that loves everybody. And there's no one else like that. You are, are awesome people. I love you. I, I good, great joy to being your pastor. You don't love everybody, right? Don't show your hands, but I know it because I'm a human being. Guess what? I don't love everybody. But I love all of you. Okay, don't worry about that. They're all out there. Okay. Right? But we don't. If we're honest, we don't love everybody. But there is one who does love everybody. His name is Jesus. So why should I follow him and trust him with with my life? It's because he's the good shepherd who redeems lost sheep. He redeemed you. He forgave you and brought you home. And he's saying, now, I've also got other sheep out there. And he wants you and I to follow him in finding those sheep and welcoming them home. And the way you and I do that is by knowing who Jesus is. 
and trusting him every step of the way. Saying he is a good shepherd. So that when you and I encounter and interact with lost sheep, that we would view them just as that. As lost sheep in need of grace and love. Who have just wandered off a little bit. And that we would point them to the good shepherd and say, he loves you already. He has brought grace and forgiveness for you. And he is bringing you home. And here is how he does it in verse 17. For the, this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. He said, here's how you know that he's the good shepherd who loves all people and brings wandering, lost, sinful sheep back home. The cross and the resurrection. He is the one who gives his life and then rises again to say, see, I am your good shepherd who redeems you, forgives you, and gives you eternal life. So if you ever struggle with this, and I know you will because you're a human being, and Satan is working against you to question, is he really the good shepherd? Should I follow him? And one of the ways Satan also works on us is getting us to doubt that good news, that he's a good shepherd who forgives sheep that get lost and wander away. Because as a pastor, one of the things I counsel people the most on is, does God still love me? It is the most common form of pastoral counseling that I ever deal with every place I go. I did this, I wandered off this way, I, re- I ran away. Like, I didn't just like wander away. I, I went in the opposite direction. Does he still love me? Well, if you're a note taker, here's a Bible verse to memorize. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. St. Paul writes, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. So yeah, you and I are going to wander off. We're not always going to listen to the voice of Jesus. We're not always going to trust him as the good shepherd. But the good news for you and me and every other sheep and every other person on the planet is that he's the good shepherd who gives his life to redeem and forgive lost sheep and to bring them home. And if ever you get confused about it or forgetful or you kind of wander off and you're wondering, can I still come back home? Paul writes, if we are faithless, if we wander off, he remains faithful. He remains the good shepherd who loves his sheep. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are the good shepherd who loves all of his sheep, us and every other person on the planet. May we be bringers of good news of your grace and mercy into the world so that all the lost sheep may know your voice, may call you savior and trust in your death and resurrection for forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life. In your name we pray, amen.